Hi. <gasps> Hello. <laughs> You're here. Super. How are you? I'm here. I wish I had my Greek paraphernalia. It's in the back <laughs> <part> right now. <laughs> I'm so sorry about all the uh, tech kerfluffle on the front, but thanks for sorry. your patience. I mean, like, where do I have to go? <laughs> Fair. The painful truth yeah. for all of us. Well, welcome everybody to House Calls. It's a virtual series from the University of Michigan Institute for the Humanities, where we've been checking in with artists through this time of COVID-19 about what they're thinking and making and just seeking out human connection and a conversation really. Um, I'd like to take this time first to introduce everybody. I'm Amanda Krugliak. I'm the arts curator at the Institute for the Humanities. And I'd like to introduce you to Angela Abiodun, who is our Collaborations and Outreach Manager. Hello. Juliet Heinley is our hey. Gallery Coordinator and also Production Manager for House Calls. Thank you so much, Rashan. Thanks for having us over today. Hey, awesome. And of course, Rashan Rucker is our guest today. He's an artist deeply influenced by the city of Detroit and his work explores the conditioning of black men and issues of identity. Uh, his sketches and his drawings, often done in colored pencil and pen, are commitments really to the marks he makes as a fellow human. And uh, his work, American Ornithology, thinks about the metaphor of the pigeon in regards to the conditioning of black men and black bodies as they are often cast aside and unable to fly. It is so great to see you, Rashan. So good to be here, I'm excited. Yeah, really, really happy. We've had a few conversations over this time by phone, so it's great to see your face. Um, I guess I just wanna start with our question. How are you doing? Doing, doing much better. Uh, I was sick in early March with you know, what my doctor suspected was COVID and, you know, sick for maybe two or three weeks and got to feeling better finally around mid-April. Now I'm feeling pretty much all the way good. So had a test two weeks ago, it was negative. So who knows, you know, my doctor was like, we'll get an antibody test next just to see if you, you know, if that was what we suspected. And other than that, you know, everything has been going about as good as, possible you know my mom's been a little sick so it's been it's been kind of chaotic and having a 13 year old son that's on the autism spectrum like his rituals have completely went out the window and you know they have a very rigid scheduling thing that kind of helps them get through life so you know I, I look at the bright side of everybody's healthy everybody's safe so it's just it's good to kind of be you know if you're going to be locked in be locked in with family and know that you know you're not trapped in the house you're safe in the house so that's kind of trying to look at it in that type of way i have kind of took yesterday to get organized and get situated and i was like it's time to kind of get back to that because for a while i had like the worst insomnia ever i just this is how it started which is crazy when i was sick i got so scared to go to sleep because I, I don't want to die in my sleep or I don't want something to happen to me and everybody else is asleep. So what I did was I was like forcing myself to stay up. And I think part of that was probably like over information because I was reading like everything I could and completely freaked out about it. And yeah. so now I've like had to, I've taken the last couple of weeks and kind of, you know, stop reading as much and stop digesting as much. And, and that was hard for me because I don't know if you guys know, but my first life was in journalism. I was a journalist for 20 years. Oh, and so okay. I just, I innately wake up and read papers and do that type of stuff. You know, I had to like make myself back away from that. So sometimes too much information could not be good. <laughs> yeah. I've also found during this time that there are like practices that I would do that kind of like increase my anxiety. Have you found that there's other ways that you've had to 
other practices that you've had to like morph to be like to be like functional during this time? I think I made like a conscious decision to try to read like different things. Like, you know, I started I went back to reading about sports more, reading about other things and opinion pieces and you know, all these other things and then uh Actually, it's funny, uh, the Michael Jordan 10 part documentary that's going on right now kind of broke me out of some of yeah. that. <laughs> it kind of put me in a whole nother mind space watching that. And so I was like, you know, this is a break, you know, from CNN and just like that 24 hour news cycle I was stuck on. And I, and, I, and I say that, but that is what informs a lot of my artwork is that, that consistency of reading and taking the yeah. information. So I had to break a little bit of that you know, just to, to to try to get myself back to some normalcy. Given that you're backing away from media in this moment, but that was typically your source of inspiration for your art, where are you looking in this moment as you're like getting back into creating for inspiration? So I'm kind of working on two things at one time. So I have a solo show in Miami in September of this year at Nomdi Contemporary. And it's focused on what Amanda talked about earlier is uh, my bird work. And it's, the show is Contemplation of Flight. And it's more about just thinking about how to get to a better situation. And I have a, a show following February 2021 back here in Detroit with M Contemporary, who I work with here, uh, a print making show called Up From the Red Clay. And that's all about me being a person from the South. Because I'm mm-hmm. not from Detroit. I moved. It's, it's crazy. I always consider myself not from Detroit, but my family's from here. I spent every okay. summer of my life from the age of five wow. to 19 in Detroit because my grandparents mm-hmm. were here. But just like every other kid, you get sent to your grandparents' house in the summertime. Right. So I think I had the best of both worlds. I'm living in rural North Carolina during the school year. And in the summertime, we're getting shipped to the east side of Detroit. So it was like I had to experience, you know, both these things. And the printmaking show was primarily about my family. So mm-hmm. that that work has been easier to do during this time because it's like I'm working on memories and photos. And and it's heavy, but not as heavy as the birds. Yeah. You know, because I think the birds are like dealing with a lot of trauma and death and more so this printmaking work that I'm doing in this show is more about a tribute to the people in my family and some obstacles they had to get through. So I've been able to kind of pick that work up a little bit and continue to work on that. And so I've been going back and forth. Do you happen to have any of that work at your house? Is there anything you'd like to share? Yeah. So- Give you a little background on the, the print making I've been doing. Um, my, my parents are both educators. My mom just retired last year. She taught Head Start in North Carolina for 30 years or more. Uh, my dad uh, was a high school English teacher and he's a poet. And uh, he grew up in North Carolina. My parents met in college. My dad moved to North Carolina and they met in college down there. So my dad recently wrote a book uh, on the floor, actually, called uh, Looking for Cooter Brown. And it's his poetry about Mm -hmm. being a Detroit guy who had to move to the South. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the work is based on my dad's writing, which I thought would be interesting for me to interpret a lot of his writing and his experiences and my experiences. And, uh, And some of them are just characters. Like, there's a... So this is like a nine by 12, like Leno cut called uh, Fast Eddie. Huh. And this is based on a man named Mr. Eddie who used to bring vegetables to my grandmother's house to sell in mm. North Carolina. And he would sell vegetables up and down the road. That was like how he made his money. And so it's, it's all about some of these characters and, you know, and things. And as, um, as Amanda talked about earlier, I, with the birds, I, I still do a lot of drawing for anything I do. Is it all starts with sketches, and so there are sketches of like uh, my great uncle. Like he always had this cane, and so there's like mm. these memories of his hands and canes, and how I this is how I kind of lead up into like what I want to do. Rashawn, you you know I I've heard you talk so just so movingly about this idea of mark making and the process of that and how it's really important to you not to go in and erase or adjust in the process. 
I think I think I started doing that because um, I know this sounds horrible. It's not a knock against like institutions or colleges, but when you go to a college and you are a major and you're learning, and it's like you get these rigid rules to being an artist, and this is how you draw, and this is how anatomy is, and this is how this is, and this is how that is. And I think leaving an institution, I was trying to figure out how to just make my marks and not worry about what was there, what wasn't there, and worry about that on the back end for like the finished pieces. Some of my life is in those sketches because it's like, Mm. it's a pen and it's very, you know, direct and you can't really bring it out. You can't erase it. You can't do any things. And all the time it's just about muscle memory and the movement of my arm. And I just kind of let it be. And, and it still, and it keeps me, you know, within my practice of drawing every day. That's what I always tell younger artists. Because the first thing they always ask you is like, how did you learn how to draw? And I'm like, I draw every day. It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's, not, it's not a secret. It's just like the consistency and the work ethic. Yeah, always you know? learning to draw. Yeah. yeah, always practicing. My son is a really good artist at 10 years old. He's a much better, you know, draftsman than I was at 10. And he'll get you know, frustrated and we'll talk and he'll say, well, I quit on this drawing and kind of ball it up and throw it away. And one day he was like, he had bought it like 30 sheets of paper and they were just on the floor. But then he got frustrated and stopped and he was like, I can't draw like you. And I was like, you're 10. I'm 42 <laughs> years old. I've been drawing <laughs> 32 more years than you and I said and guess what I'm still balling up paper at 42 years old and I was yeah. like never really stop learning it's just that yeah. consistent habit of making marks I think too rush on now more than ever that like the, there's something so poignant about the importance of these small marks we're in this moment where everything falls away as to what you know, what we thought mattered or what we thought we accomplished. And really, when you think about these drawings and how they honor just these marks we make and the accountability of those marks rather than some masterpiece or some bigger story. Um, and it's, you know, what you're saying is kind of leading into to just the printmaking I've been showing you guys. It's just like this is a way for me to give tribute to the marks that these people made. And, and it kind of counter... And it counter ties into the birds it's all about being seen yes. everybody wants yeah. to be seen right. at some point it's like you want to be recognized you want to be seen no matter what station you occupy you know and i've kind of always lived that life and tried to you know and try to just embody that even in every job i ever had in every newsroom people would be like man the janitor would come over and talk to me in my in my cubicle and people are like you know the janitor i'm like i know everybody in this building he is like no less important than the person that's editing over in the corner. And it's like, you know, you just, I think growing up, you know, in certain situations, you learn how important it is to recognize people. And I think having a son with special needs only took that further for me. Cause it's like, everybody just wants to be seen. Yeah. And like the way you're making these, like the prints that you're making are this way of, of recognizing people. And I think that, um, that it really speaks to like the complexity of our inner lives and the complexity of social systems and exactly how this, you know, this one person, whether it's somebody that, you know, is working in the same office as you or is, you know, depicted in this print that you've made, like there's so much behind, behind that person. And that like even the print you held up at the beginning really is just like a direct line into that. Yeah, there's um, there's a couple more. There's a this one in particular is, is called Cousin Thomas, and it's um, it's all about a cousin I had who a great cousin who was mute. He didn't speak, and people kind of ignored him. And this is like I made this printmaking quilt about his life, and it's about how he raised chickens and he smoked a pipe and he had hogs and he lived in this really tiny trailer. He wore suspenders every day. And it's just my way to be like, I recognize him. And I thought he was a brilliant person, even though he couldn't speak and people kind of ignored him and in whole, like, these are my ways to be like, reach back and say, you know, who would ever think seven months from now, cousin Thomas will be on a gallery wall somewhere, right. even when he wasn't recognized within his own family. Yeah. So it's just like, I, I, you know, yeah. 
Go ahead. I was going to say I love I love your work and this concept um, because I think for for people who have been cut off historically from their ancestors, specifically talking about Black people and the like complications in regards to like having access to like lineages beyond a certain point, there can become a romanticization of like who our lineages are tied to. Like you you have to be tied to someone who was seen as valuable in the community or how you understand your worth becomes so con conflated and less than. And I think your work, even though I haven't heard this, speaks about like also allowing that lineage to enhance your self-worth and your self-value. Mm -hmm. um, because like if you can find value in anyone in your legacy, regardless of what they've done, um, you can then find value and be like gracious and generous with yourself um, and be in like offer yourself the forgiveness that you may be seeking from the world. And you're absolutely um, you're absolutely right. Like um, uh, my grandmother and my great grandmother always had these amazing sayings. And, you know, one that stuck with me in particular was about value and those things she talked about. And. I remember telling my grandmother how I wanted to do something else and do this. And she said, um, she said, the grass is always greener, but you got to mow that yard too. Yeah. So <laughs> you go, she, was, she told me, she said, you can go over there, but there's some grubs and some patches and all these other things that you're not going to see until you get over there. Yeah. And so it made me kind of appreciate stations that I was in at points in my life and not necessarily trying to always look forward to the thing I thought was better and finding value in who I was and where I was at. And uh, I think a lot of that is, is, is influenced in my work. And it's just like the times that we're living in is, is so, so crazy. And, and thinking that, you know, I've had so many conversations with Amanda about the birds and we've talked about them and, you know, even the whole issue with, you know, my being slain while he was running and, yeah, that kind of yeah. it kind of really bugged me, but kind of also made me think about the birds and, you know, thinking about because one of the big things I bring about with pigeons is they don't migrate. They don't go yeah. to a place, yeah. a better, a better place. And um, when I think about those things, about the contemplation of flight or going to better spaces, I'm thinking, well, this person was out jogging, trying to do something to better themselves health wise or whatever. And I'm like, you end up not even being able to do that. And that's what happens a lot. It's like that condition just builds and builds and builds and builds and builds to where you don't want to push for anything. Yeah. And so I'm still trying to break some of those things with my own kids. And, yeah. and I think as an artist, you kind of have to speak to that. Well, I, if, if we're ready for the next question, that kind of like leads me right into like a larger question. Um, so schools are closed. And so there's been questions about changing educational expectations, specifically in this moment. But I think that could those questions can be within the larger conversation. But um, you have your kids now for greater amounts of time during the day, and you're more of a director of their learning. Um, and it's interesting to like find out that you're also a child of teachers. So that influences how you're going to show up with them. But I'm curious to hear what this has meant for you in this time. Are there more opportun opportunities for you to like encourage their inner artists? Are your kids trying to like guide, explore and explore their interests versus following a directed structure? And are they like pulling you along for the ride? What is that relationship with they're, you as an artist and them to their educational in, in this moment? They're more following like guided structure from schools and stuff, but um it's interesting, like some of the assignments, like one of the assignments they had to do was to make kind of like a World War II poster, but like a keep positive during COVID. And I thought that was like an interesting assignment, you know, and I was thinking like, mm -hmm. wow, you know, that could be a cool assignment for just artists in general to mm -hmm. make these type of kind of statements and posters. And because I think, um, you know, just on the side note, I think we're probably going to end up moving into some of those large structural government programs at some point. This doesn't like yeah. ease up in a while. But mm -hmm. um, school wise, it's funny because um, it's almost like they're more focused, like they want to do the work really quickly so they can just be done with it. 
and like play Fortnite for the rest of the day or play video <laughs> games or so like, like it's just like they'll go into three or four hours straight at work and then it's like we're done and we've done our work and the biggest thing right now we're working on is one has to write an autobiography of himself which he is struggling with which so wow. we're going to be doing that. Um, we're taking all these notes, but he's struggling with the structure of it. But it's always hard to write about yourself. Yeah. And yeah. write about experiences and those types of things. And But I think more so, like, they're struggling with the that non-socialization, um, you know, like, just being around kids and friends. And because I don't know if you've, like, noticed little kids, all they do is touch each other and hug on each other. And, sure. You know. Yeah around each other when they're walking and I think they miss that and they miss like just being in the building because you get you know they they get those rituals over time and I'm kind of worried that school might not even start in the fall because I'm already seeing colleges cancel in-person classes for the fall and I'm like okay where's this going to go is this going to be just like a a really long-term homeschooling type of deal or what Mm, yeah I guess, like thinking about what you're talking about and, and feeling this, you know, on one hand, everything right now is so uncertain and open-ended. And on the other hand, I feel like we're in a constant state of, of upheaval and shifts from, you know, week to week. Uh, uh, and I'm coming to this from the frame of the humanities, uh, from the frame of being just fellow humans, of the fullness of what that means to be human. Um, what is our role potentially as artists, uh, art in this moment? Like, what is the role of artists in a time of crisis like this? I mean, I, I think it, I think it kind of remains the same, and it's even more important to speak the truth in moments like this, yeah. and, and to continue what you've been doing. I mean, I mean, it's making me think even more about the work that I'm doing and just how. You know, because a lot of the work I do is about identity and equity and all those things. And I'm like, look at how equity is playing out during the pandemic. Yeah. It, it's playing out in, in the worst way. I, I think artists have to reflect that. You know, I think artists have to reflect the protests that are going on. I think they have to reflect just what COVID is doing in general. I think one of the things that artists have to do is kind of what I'm doing is in this tribute to my family. Like, I always think about how are these people who are passing the COVID going to be remembered? Because one of the big things yeah. that, that hits me is totally. like, you don't even have a chance to celebrate these people that are losing their lives. There's no funerals. There's no going away. There's no, you know, you know, my friend told me, he's like, my grandma is in hospice. We can't even go see her. Yeah. So it's like, how do you celebrate these people? How do you tell these stories? And I think you have to continue to still do that type of important work. Yeah. Especially at a time like this, it's like this has to be noted. I mean, we we are, you know, artists are a lot like journalists. You are like the people who collect and you know and present history and what it was. Yeah. And my yeah. hope is that artists continue to do that. Fifty years from now, the only thing that my grandkid might see is a painting in a museum that was painted during the time of COVID. Yeah, yeah. That might be that might be their interaction with it, but I'm definitely yeah. thinking about celebration. You know, of people. I mean, I think we have to just learn to celebrate even the smallest things, and I think this is gonna help that. I think people will celebrate small things more coming out yeah. of this. Yeah, that's how important it is, and you'll celebrate each other and people. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's good to just look at the three of you because I don't have any other interaction with the outside world doing this. <laughs> it's good to even because we're such humans are so sociable. Yeah, yeah. And we kind of crave to be around other people. Yeah. And so I just think you know my whole my biggest hope out of all of this is that we will create a new and better world with more empathy, with more love, with more kindness, mm-hmm. more appreciation for people and who they are. Nothing else, I bet you appreciate the people who work at the grocery store a lot more than you did three months ago. <laughs> right. Because I'm pretty yeah. sure nobody cared about them three months ago. Yeah, I mean, like, in the way that your your work, um, you know, honors and, and elevates the people around you and, and these ideas of, um, of, of celebration and, and passing the torch, 
And and also about your your kids uh, World War Two poster assignment of this like message of you know this kind of message of of hope or encouragement or you know an ability to push forward like what what would your World War Two poster say you know what like what are you thinking about in terms of what's uh, hopeful or helpful as a as a message forward you know I think mine would probably just speak simply to like put one foot in front of the other every day you know you know my my grandfather used to tell me you know if, if you wake up every day you still got time on the clock to make a difference I think you have to approach it like that like I'm here and you know there's other people who've lost their lives and it's now it's my responsibility and duty to stand in the gap mm. and try to make it a better space you know I'm just hoping people realize that like okay we're in a pandemic but you're also still here you're still here you still, still here. have, you still have <laughs> responsibility maybe my poster would just say that still here like I said, my grandparents, my grandmother would always say, you know, character is built in the valley. So you're in the valley, but you're still here. And I think we just have to remember that. Like when I come out of the valley, and she would always say, when you think about it, between every valley is a mountaintop. So there's always a mountaintop experience. So coming out of the valley, hopefully we all have a mountaintop experience that we can share with each other. Yeah. Yeah. Rishan, thank you so, so much for thank this you. conversation. And <laughs> thank for you. This, thank you so much. for. And I'm so, so glad you're feeling better. Wow. Yeah, yeah. it's great to see you. <laughs> you offered us so much. Thank you. Yeah. I have to show you my doorknob before you leave. <laughs> People always ask me, like, how are you making all this printmaking at your house and you don't have a press? So I literally use an old wooden knob <laughs> that I've had for years and a spoon. Mm. So this is uh this is what where I are they use. from? Actually I think it's just from an old cabinet. Like I had them for years and the spoon was made uh actually by one of my fraternity brothers. He sent it to me <laughs> it's actually for eating but I was like hey I want one of those spoons to use in my printmaking and so I've been using it and uh the last thing I'll show you is my last piece I've worked on, and it's called The Procession. Huh. And it's about the experience of carrying three of my grandfather's coffin as a pallbearer. Wow. Have you seen that video? It's a video. I'm not sure what West African country it's out of, but of the dancing pallbearers? Yes. Oh my goodness, that makes me think of that. And that's such a such an interesting mm -hmm. moment to be in when you're a pallbearer. Because when I think about it, it's um I think I was really sad and it was an emotional thing. But also you're chosen to be, you're chosen to be a pallbearer because it's a thing of respect. Yeah. And so, you know, I think about my grandfather and I miss some of them, but at the same time I'm like, I was one of the people who carried them to their their last resting space. Yeah. Yeah, it's very so, powerful to carry someone. I mean, that's such yes. a such a gesture and such a physical connection. And yeah, there's so much in that. Mm. And when you think about how often they've carried me throughout my life and many mm. times. And yeah. that was the least to give back I could give to them. Definitely. You know, when you honor these stories, everything you do, the way you move through the world, you know, the marks you make, it just feels like it's who you are. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I've always been, like, super sensitive, but definitely having a son with special needs, um, I would say, made me a much better man, a better person, much more patient, person, a much more loving person, a much more empathetic person. Because even now, when I'm... Um, I see people who have struggles or going through things. I don't look at them the same because when you are a, a caregiver for somebody, you understand it on a totally different level. Yeah. yeah. And so it's like, you know, you just no longer look at people who are struggling and say, well, they can do better. They can do this. And it's like, cause you really don't know. Yeah. Like, you know, my son is like 
moving through his life that he needs me and my wife like to really help position him. And uh, my biggest fear is never thinking about my legacy. The artist, my biggest fear and legacy is like, who's going to take care of my son when it's all over for me? So I think that. So it's like, let me try to make the best mark that I can. And I think that's why we, you know, when you wake up every morning, it's like I can make things a little bit better today. And, you know, and after a while, that little bit is a lot. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I think that cumulative, the like uh, recognition of the power of cumulative action and and small, small shifts is really, yeah, something that... Small strokes. Small details. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, and these points yeah. of contact, right? Small points yeah. of contact as human <laughs> beings. I, I tell every artist I know that's young and I say... Just get a sketchbook, start in the front, draw something on every page. And I said, I guarantee you the last page will look different from the first. It's mm-hmm. like you said, it's just that cumulative act of doing it. One foot in front of the other. It's like this yeah. one page in front of the next. Yeah. And, you know, leaving and keeping my, you know, my ancestors and elders, you know, what they told me in the back of my mind. And yeah, maybe, look, maybe I will make a steal here poster or a believe poster. <laughs> Please send us a shatter, yeah. something that you do. Yeah. I would love to see it. That's yeah. been one of the like joys of my walk. Like when I go on walks, I'll see like people have like done uh cl- not clay, but um sidewalk chalk either on the ground or on oh, their yeah, fences, or they'll have signs in their windows. Yeah. Or like yeah. And I think the the words that you chose, especially after this conversation, will have a really personal um mm-hmm. connection to me so i would love to see if it comes no pressure um yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i'm not expecting anything um but if it happens i would love to see it. i actually uh, saw one on my walk the other day and it kind of touched me and it was like i got to this house and some kid and had drew a bunch of suns and you know the clouds and the word said happiness begins here mm-hmm. and it was like i just looked at him and like this family has understood that this is their zone and they're still happy and no matter what's going on and they're elevating themselves above you know the panic and everything that's going on and so you know this is one time you know especially during this month with this mental health awareness month we all need to be like aware of each other's mental health and what's going on and you know and self-care and you know and it's okay not to be okay yeah especially during this time so so, you know, today is better than yesterday. I woke up happy about seeing you guys today. So this has like, been a joy. This has been, no. thank you so, so, thank so Thank you much so time. much. Yeah, no problem. Can't, we'll, we'll look forward to, yeah. to seeing you in real life over at the I Institute. Yeah. Yes, miss you guys too. Thank you so much. It was so good. All right. Yeah. We'll talk to you soon. Take Bye. care. Stay safe. You too. Bye. You too. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye.